believe in them. So the cap, the, yeah. Yes, sir. Well, I was going to say, um, are you ready mm -hmm. to go next? Okay. Um, we were down at uh, city council today. We were at city council. Then we went at the back room, uh, you know, where they all hang yeah. out and mm -hmm. schmooze. And uh, I sort of felt like we were at American politics ground zero. It was. Well, more several years ago than today. Today it's settled down a bit, but not much. Chicago, just remember Chicago, we think of the city council, and naturally the thing, first thing that comes to mind is Richard Daly the Elder. You know, like Pliny the Elder, Richard Daly the Elder, sort of a serial comic Caesar, in a sense. What he said goes. And they were, Mike Royko, the column who described the city council as a chamber of trained seals. And so they would follow his, whatever he said was the word. Every now and then there was, once in a while there was an independent alderman, Len Dupre, case in point. And he would get up, you know, now microphones came into being, electronics are now part of the scene. And when he got up to speak, to challenge something of his honor, the mayor, the mic had be turned off. Daly would just nod and <laughs> oh my. So Dupre says it was a great training ground for me. I learned how to say, be very succinct, get things, get coils of wisdom in 10, 15 seconds. <laughs> he knew it'd be turned off. Chicago must remember as a blue collar city primarily. It didn't have the graces of what are called story cities like New York, New Orleans, and San Francisco. They're called story cities. As though Chicago were dull, had no story. Chicago had far more stories to it than any all these cities put together. But it was blue collar primarily. And so the people came when this huge complex was being built after the Chicago fire of 1871, and there was swamp. And here came architects as well as the blue-collar people working in where? In steel, farm equipment, packing house. So when Sandberg in the celebrated poems book of Chicago, hog butcher the world, of course he was right, the stockyards, the biggest in the world at the time. Why, sitter of the, of the nation's railroad, 1,000 passenger cars would pass through Chicago each day through its a dozen or so depots. The grain market, you know, of course, the grain market and, the st and uh, steel, all this was Chicago. Today, of course, you know, it's taken a tremendous beating for a number of reasons. One, the multinationals taking over, conglomerates taking over, and of course, moving plants to places where there are no unions, where the labor could be described as surf, slave labor, certainly surf labor, that, plus the nature of technology itself, the computer, and the chip, I think it used to mean the words chip. To me, hardware, software means, hardware means hammer, nail, software, pillowcases, Turkish towels, so I'm not up on that. But we do know all that has played a role in devastating our cities perhaps more than most cities, because it was the industrial city, city of the skyscrapers. No accident Chicago brought forth the skyscrapers. Steel was the ingredient in here, and the visionaries like Louis Sullivan and Frank Lloyd Wright. And so it was a city of Eastern Europeans who came, Mediterraneans came, from the deep south, poor whites came, especially after World War I and World War II. As far as the black people of the South, there were two migrations after World War I and World War II. As a result, Chicago was two big, big black areas. Uh, the South Side, more sophisticated, older people there, came at the end of World War I. Uh, the uh, West Side, more deprived, if possible. So that's part of Chicago, the popular, and the Hispanic population is growing. So. The minorities or the new groups are uh, the people of color to a great extent. And so Chicago has uh, this particular division too, the segregation. Well, you could do, you could travel from all the way along the outer drive, the beautiful outer drive face Lake Michigan. You could travel all the way from the south, Gary, Indiana, all the way north, Evanston, Illinois, and not once see a slum or a ghetto. In the distance, you will see those huge housing projects, the biggest in the world, Robert Taylor homes, but from a distance. So that's Chicago, too. 
as far as the city and corruption, well, Chicago may be most, may have been most flamboyant in its corruption, but I was rather proud of it. I call Chicago not the most corrupt city, but the big daddy of them all. And so the slogan originally of Chicago, way back when it was being built, of course, there was the matter of parks were being discussed and trees and forests were discussed. So the Latin slogan, Urbs in Horto, was the slogan. City in the garden. In fact, Olmsted, the planner, the garden, the one of Central Park, New York, was in Chicago too, making these plans. But later on, either, either Mike Royko, the columnist, the irreverent columnist, or Nelson Aldrin, the irreverent novelist, conceived the phrase, Urbs in Horto is not exactly, it should be Ubi est mea, where's mine? And that more or less a Chicago thing. As an anecdote goes with him, involving Royko, at the time of Daly the Elder, appointments were made without question. But now, during the 60s, new kinds of independent congressmen came in. There's a black, uh, a block of black guys, but also some white independents, one of whom was Dick Simpson of the near north side, who was also a teacher at uh, University of Illinois, Chicago campus. And he was challenging daily on occasion. And when someone was appointed to the zoning board, the zoning board dealing with real estate, who was also a member of Arthur Rubloff and Company, the leading realtor, but also the son of Daly's right-hand man, Alderman Tom Keene, who later on spent time in the Pokies. See, Daly was not interested in money, by the way. Daly, you can, they're going to find you. This is one thing only, power. But Tom Keene was the money man. Well, Tom Keene's son, Tommy Keene, of Arthur Rubloff and Company, is appointed to the zoning board that determines the nature of real estate. And so this descending alderman gets up, Simpson, and says, this is nepotism, but first, more than that, it's conflict of interest. And Daly says, what do you mean by nepotism? What do you mean by conflict of interest? And he goes on to say, you don't know, you have no children, you had children, you'd know why Tommy King's mother is a fine Polish-American woman. And Mike's calm next day has, my mother's a fine Polish-American woman, where's mine? So in a sense, that was Chicago at the time. Is, is ethnicity a big deal here? Ethnicity? Had always, see, that's a hard one to answer. Ethnicity has always been a big deal in Chicago, especially among Eastern Europeans who've come here. There are different neighborhoods. There's the, uh, there's the Ukrainian neighborhood, there's the Lithuanian neighborhood, Polish neighbor, even the Eastern European have their own kind of neighborhood. And it's the, the bung it was called, you know, the bungalow neighborhoods, two flats, you see. Living on the first floor would be the old steel worker and who saved money to have the house. Up above lives his daughter and son-in-law. That was the pattern for Chicago. The only trouble with that sort of ethnicity is also a suspicious of the outsider, especially the black. And that became part of the Chicago scene. But How does that play out in the just Jew. And he got the votes of guys who were known as anti Semites most of their lives. It's the hierarchy of values. <laughs> oh, he got a big vote. <laughs> Second time around, Harold. Stuff. I mean, it's, yeah, it's, uh, it's not what you're looking for. Well, no, part of it is, and then part of it, I'm going to ask you to be a little more specific about some of the... See, it, it strikes us that last year we came to the election, and we hung out with a lot of different aldermen, mm -hmm. you know, Irish aldermen, black, Mexican, mm -hmm. Americans, mm -hmm. and Puerto Ricans, and uh, it just, the whole city strikes us as being very tribal. Oh, and of course. But then isn't it so most industrial cities. I've never seen anything quite like Chicago. Yeah, well, that's good. That's, I think you're right. It is. Well, let me stick with those bungalows for a minute. And what's happening to the tribal, to the tribal aspect of it also. You working now? Mm -hmm. See, when you speak of ethnicity, and a moment ago you touched on something, you spoke of Chicago having a tribal aspect. A moment ago we spoke of the Ukrainian neighborhood, the Lugan neighborhood, Lugan, Lithuanian neighborhood, the Bohunk neighborhood the uh, Bohemians, Czechs neighborhood. All this, there was a tribal quality, but since World War II, 
changes have occurred. And ironically, it was the New Deal that did it. It was the GI Bill of Rights. And so when the soldier came home from World War II, he could have a mortgage lifted or paid for, and so in a new kind of suburb. You see, until World War II, suburbs are where the rich people lived, most of the blue cities. But now blue-collar suburbs came into being, especially GI suburbs, like Levittown out east and Park Forest here in Chicago. They're the most noted and celebrated. As a result of which, something happened to tribalism to some extent. The young kids comes who would have lived on the second floor of that bungalow that their father-in-law uh, owned, paying for, now live in the suburb. And once you live in the suburb, something happens. In Chicago, it's key. There's no question that the suburb is anti-city. And the suburbs very often take advantage of the city without paying any taxes to the city. And votes in the county, that somehow affects the city life, too. So the tribalism of the city has taken something of a beating in the movement away from parent and parent and law. However, with the new arrivals, with Hispanic people and with black people, and for that matter, Asiatic people, just the other day in Chicago, a gang of Cambodian kids uh, kicked to death the Filipino kid. So we have, you see, there's sort of a uh, egalitarianism among gangs, in a sense, of values. <laughs> You've got to be better than, better than the one just above you. By the way, uh, people hardly dream of being, of questioning those way, way up above. It's the one simply there, or the one below you. Why does a poor white in the South uh, so long been used against the black? Martin Luther King put it in a speech in Selma, and in Montgomery, at the end of the Sun Montgomery March, the poor white is fed Jim Crow instead of bread. And he accepts that, but it's not very nutritious, you see. And so Lillian Smith, the Southern writer, spoke of poor white and uh, rich white talking. And the poor white is told by the rich white, I'll pay you half a buck an hour. He says, I can't live on that. I got five kids. I'll get a nigger for two bits an hour. You're better than him. He, oh, yeah, I'm better than him. And so that's part of Chicago, too. Did the did the old man understand tribalism, and does the young young Bailey the elder understand? Well, the the old mayor, Mayor the uh, Richard the first, Mayor the elder, understood tribalism very well indeed. He also had a great memory in Ryko's excellent book, Boss. It's the best study of city power I have ever. How the old man was not that brilliant at all. He wasn't at all that brilliant. If he were, the 1968 convention would never have taken that turn. If he were more intelligent than he was, we have to emphasize this. Of course, he'd have fed those kids in Lincoln Park coffee and donuts, would have broken it like that. But he didn't. It stayed right into their hands. You see, I mean, I'm not saying they didn't have a good cause. Uh, the young people did have a good cause. Were protesting, but nonetheless, he could have swung that easily. But in his own feeling of his own sense of power and isolation from the realities of the day, he did stupid things. That resulted in the, what was called police riot. But he knew tribalism very well indeed. And he just kept track, kept accounts. And he the favorites he knew that there was a payback to him. How did it work? All of when he, a job, for example, he was appointed, they owed, they, the precinct captain would come out and call out that vote, and it was automatic, his vote. But something was happening, again, in his removal from reality, when he offended a black congressman who was a supporter for years, Ralph Metcalf, the congressman, who was a former Olympic star. He was an honored guy. And when Metcalf became anti daily spoke out for the first time, it was stunning. And that, of course, sowed the seed for the uh, discovery of Harold Washington and his subsequent election, and he had the slightest idea, you know, about Harold. Daly died before that, of course. But when he offended, you see, remember, you must remember that it was a phrase they called plantation politics. And so the blacks of the city, they were great in number, always voted Democratic Party, 
because they have an overseer. I mean, Bill Dawson, Congressman Dawson, considered the most powerful black politician in America at the time. And he was more than Adam Clayton Powell, I'd say, because the control he had over the black vote, he would, of course, follow through on the whole Chicago tradition or the hack political tradition of any large city, handing out favors and baskets, etc. But he was the overseer for the machine. But the machine today will never be what it was. Uh, the opposition, the coalition, anti-machine, led by Harry Washington and others among Hispanic people, too, is now in disarray completely. But that doesn't mean the machine has come back. It's there now, and uh, Daly can win hands down uh, next election. But it's never the same. It won't be. A new coalition can be formed that will challenge it if the situation presents itself. It calls upon other matters nationally as well as local for that. So Chicago right now, I don't think is that much different than any large American city. As you said, to be a mayor of any large city is a hopeless task. But you can't, you can't discuss a city unless you discuss the country, unless you discuss the world itself. You can't discuss Chicago unless you discuss NAFTA or GATT and jobs taken away from the country. You can't discuss that at all. You can't discuss the city, you discuss the, the derogation of labor, the labor movement that's coming back in some quarters, we know, but no question it's taking terrible beatings. You can't discuss the city unless you discuss history and know a past. No more than you can discuss race unless you know a past. And so as you do the series on American cities, that past is always there. You have to consider and how the changes occurred and what it is that made the changes occur. Any other questions? No, no other questions. Can you ask that another time? No, no. I don't know if you <laughs> got what you want, <laughs> Andrew. Yeah, let, me, let me just say a couple yeah. more things. One of the things that struck us about American, about Chicago politics, um, it's both sledgehammer sometimes in style. We <laughs> went out with some crews where they were tearing each other's signs down in the middle of the night. At the same time, it can be scalpel precise. And somebody saying a word and the supporters pick things up. And it seems it seems somewhat Machiavellian and maybe Byzantine or Renaissance, whatever whatever sort of analogy you want to make. Uh, well, Chicago, I suppose you could say Chicago is a muscular, again to use cliches, Sandbergian, Sinead you know, the broad shoulders, big shoulders. That it certainly is and has been. At the same time, the politics was such a stage of development in a hack way, but sophisticatedly hack, if there is such a phrase, you see. The nuances are involved. Again, I call on Royko. He would tell of a certain restaurant in town where judges would gather and hack politicians and quasi-legal people would gather, some would be hooves. There was no line of demarcation. They all knew one another. Mike would describe the subtle way in which envelopes are passed back and forth. No word need be said. No word need be used. Like I'm sitting there, college boy. It was right near the radio station we were. It was a very, very celebrated place known for its corned beef sandwich. And, 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 and so I'd sit there. And there is Musha Bear. He's part of the, one of the Jewish boys of the syndicate. And uh, he's behind the counter. Well, as far as I know, he's in Joliet in prison, see? Because he was sentenced. Now, what's he doing behind the counter? So I say, hey, Musha, well, my God. He doesn't see me. So I sit down, I have the uh, I have the salmon salad sandwich on rye, you know, and Dorothy's the waitress. She's a veteran around there. Says, hey, Dorothy, there's Mr. Bear there. She says, do you want a cup of coffee? Yeah, I said, well, no, no, what, what do you think about that? I'm so bright, college boy. She says, you want, you want, you want some uh, dessert with that, too? I said, oh, yeah, but I can't get over much. She says, I'm, as I'm going outside, hey, Mush, it's great seeing you. I'm not there. So that also the subtle. The fact is he did wind up in the trunk of a car eventually. But that isn't the point. The point is things are done, you don't question, you don't say. They're said, of course he got a clout. Of course he was out. Of course he should be in Joliet. <laughs> and he wasn't, you see. And so this is more or less accepted. And I think it works out. It would work today, too, to a great extent. It might not be the clout of the actual mob, all of George still has, but other kinds of clout. 
part of a big realty guy, the part of big money, we know all that. We see the contributions made, we see PACs, we see what's happening in candidates, so why not Chicago? Why should we be deprived of that particular privilege in the industry? It just seems to be a place full of political intrigue, where everybody plays it. Everybody knows that some alderman is maybe going to side with somebody else and elect a congressman. There's just this Oh, well, thing. that's then, for example, when McGovern was the Democratic candidate for president. Of course he was shafted by the Chicago machine, as well as he was in other cities, too. And often the precinct captain would say, now, look, you want to vote for this particular alderman. Vote for this guy, state representative. Never mind the president. You don't have to, we're not saying vote for McGovern. You don't, don't. In fact, they were discouraging you from doing that. No, no, just vote for this, in the, the guy close to that ward, the guy close to that precinct, so the precinct can protect his own captain, to protect his own job, too. Of course. Oh, that was often the case. It, it were, uh, certainly the case of George McGovern. There was a definite shafting. One more question. Chicago alderman, sort of a, 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 fig, a figure of legend. What is a Chicago alderman? What is Chicago alderman? Well, the old time alderman say Patty Bowler. Patty Bowler of the 43rd Ward. Patty was a bartender. So this is pre daily. He was there during daily, at Daily the Elder, but he was there, of course, during Daily the Elders. Served for terms and terms and terms. Patty. They want to get Patty, and they had him on something, and they were get, and, and someone raised the point in the city committee says, "What are we hollering about? He, Chicago ain't ready for reform. Let's all go to my bar and have a drink." That was Patty. Well, they can't be that obvious now. You see, what's happened is the big roundhouse puncher has been replaced by a deft, well, not too deft, but a, by a boxer instead. But they're not that brilliant boxers either. They just run around. They, you know, the guys go backtrack a lot and do that. But the old roundhouse puncher is gone. That time is over. Now you have something else. I suggest something less. If something better, I'd love to see it. There was a moment in Chicago when that coalition out of the 60s came into being in later on in the next decade with Harold Washington. So that was an astonishing moment. And if Harold Washington, he, he was re-elected the second term, and by the way, the re-election was much easier than the first because some of the old boys, the old guard, were seeing the garbage is picked up on time. You can only play that old game city falling apart. Now there's a cartoon, if you can get that cartoon there. See the one up there? Can you get that? We'll All right. By Oliphant. And it's when da daily, they daily died. There's a cartoon of the trains will no longer run on time. The takeoff on Mussolini, of course. And the fi and I'll never forget that. There were people who were scared. He, he wouldn't let his daughter go out at night. He was a corporation counsel, or so, a corporation, a businessman. Wouldn't let his daughter go out at night. She was going to fall apart because daily died. Now, when Harold Washington died, that same man, encountered me, I encountered him somewhere at a lunch, and he said, Harold Washington, I wonder who's going to be the mayor. Not Harold Washington, dead what's going to happen to the city. I wonder who's going to be mayor. And he gave you an idea as to what he felt, not simply about race, but about daily and myth and legend. Mr. Circle, you know, in the old days of, uh, of Daly the First, yes, yes, thank you. no, that's, that's all right. It's, it's in Daly the First, you know, they said that politics, good politics is good government, and good government is good politics. Mm. Okay, this city, things ran, or people thought they ran because of the politics. Can you explain that to somebody who doesn't know anything? Well, about I don't think. Look, look at me, too. Yeah. I don't think uh, people in Chicago ever thought they ran the city. Yeah. There was the cliche, there was that phrase good politics, good government, good thing. What do you mean by good politics? What those who said it meant was, listen to us. Don't question us. We'll see the garbage is picked up on time. We'll see that the trains run on time. Any efficient administrator could do that. Those are essentials. Those are sine qua knowns of a government. But people think, hey, these guys are good. Don't question me. And of course, bring us the vote. And of course, a lot of stuff took place while people don't question. They were questioning 
well, a very good way. At, uh, there, there are seeds, seeds of dissent that led to good things for a moment in the 60s. Like there was a neighborhood, a blue-collar neighborhood, a white, we call ethnic neighborhood, old neighborhood, that was about to be destroyed because the city plus the cement lobby plus the South Street brokers were planning an expressway to go through it to speed the traffic, as though we need speedier traffic. Expressway to go through that would destroy this neighborhood. And as I got up in that meeting, they were worried, stiff and crying, whose house is going to go first? Whose block is going to go first? Someone got up, Mary Lou Wolf, a woman of nine kids who never questioned, got up and said, why should anybody's home go first or block? Do we need this expressway to begin with? Let's fight it. And they did. It was called uh, Citizens Action Program, CAP. And guess what? They stopped the expressway. Thought that that's a little Hispanic woman, China down on appearance, a young mother, about six kids, stopped waste management from coming down and depositing stuff in her community. By using Solinsky techniques, the techniques of a government, of a community organization, in which you think of stuff that hadn't been thought of before. So they couldn't get to see the, go the governor at the time. He just had new furniture put in his office, and they were kept waiting for, and that's they came with the little kids who had taffy apples. And the kids' taffy apples were practically making a mess out of the new furniture. Just, oh, it was just a cliche. And once people see that when you say good politics, you mean good for you, they began as good for whom is the point. And that, that, that led to some pretty good movements. And now there seems to be a sense of despair and a, a disarray aspect. I have one more question over here, and, and, and you could answer it answer to Louis. Yeah. Um, you know, I was reading your book, Chicago, mm -hmm. and you were talking about going to rallies when you were a kid with your brother. Mm -hmm. And Chicago, at least as I remember it, Chicago was also known for local political campaign songs. Do you remember any of them? Well, I'm thinking now about moments my brother and I went to the Ashland Auditorium, which is a famous union hall on Ashland and Graham. Now it's part of an express. That's part of the court. But then, before going for a chocolate malt or that legged drug store across the street, we'd, we'd go to this place. Everything was for free. There was a guy running against the old, crooked Republican mayor, Big Bill Thompson, who never threatened to punch King, jo King George V in the nose. And it was Deaver, a rather respected Democrat, Judge ran against him. It was, it was a Deaver gathering. And everything was there. The, the idea, they were, I don't remember the exact songs, but I'm sure there was a song about Deaver. And there were wrestling matches, and there were the little Egypt dancers. There was everything, to, and of course, free popcorn and Cracker Jacks and hot dogs. And though those were rallies in the old time tradition, they may still be going on, I imagine. But that, as I remember, it was a neighborhood rally. By the way, that was in the neighborhood. Not only was it for Judge Deaver, but also probably for the alderman as well. Oh, the, oh, that matter of, well, the I know songs today, this goes way back, the whole matter of songs. During elections, during the Roosevelt campaign, Franklin D., there were dozens of songs. As I can happy days again, row, row, row with Roosevelt, there were Teddy Roosevelt song, and always were songs. It's less of that today, I think, less participation in the process. And, uh, but the idea of campaign songs were always part of a pattern. So there's certain, now, uh, you see, there's a danger in nostalgia here. There's a danger of speaking of the good old days. They weren't. But I think there was more of the, you must admit, there was more of the human touch. Now, imagine today, te without television, without television, people would meet. Now they're home. There is no tavern gathering, for better or for worse. There is no church gathering, political, I mean, for better or for worse. It's at home, and you also, whoever has the most dough wins it. Now, this has always been the case, but not as blatant as it is. Now it's bragged about. It was never talked about before. The guy's a better candidate. He's got more money. This is the, he's not going to, and no one discusses the, 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 immo the immorality of it, the, the non-democracy of it. And then, it was always the case, but it was hidden. It's like scabs today. When scabs go by, they pose for the camera. Never was that the case. There was a 
through the back through the back door at always. Even Ford cabs, you see, always the back door. So in a sense, it has something shameless in that the dough itself becomes a factor that is an advertised factor. And so the events I'm talking about were better because there was a, a human touch to it. There was a sound of a shout. There was a voice you actually heard rather than see or imagine you're hearing on television. That's part of it. Can you tell us the um, uh, Indian or uh, the, the, uh, the Latin inscription story again? The Chicago slogan, the original slogan of Chicago, the official slogan, Orbs in Horto, Latin, Orbs City, Horto, Horticultural Garden, uh, City in the Garden. But later on, as years passed, when you go through Daly and Cermak and Johnny Bapow and the old and Patty Bowler down through the years, it was very simple. Uh, Mike Royko or Nelson Organ said, the slogan should be changed from Urbs in Horto to Ubi, Ubi, U-B-I, Est Mea, M-E-A. Ubi Est Mea meaning, where's my end? And that is what they say should be the Chicago, Chicago slogan. And I say it should be the slogan for every large city in this country. Do you believe that you can understand America by looking at politics? You should look at Louis in this day. I mean, that's, that's the core of our thing. How do you, can, can you understand this country by looking at the way our politics is collected? Well, you understand it by looking not at national politics. It has to be at local politics and neighborhood politics. It has to be that specific. You see the guy, and he says, I'll get your kid out of that jam he's in. I'll get that window that your kid broke paid for. Don't worry about that. I'll see, you may not get this job, but I'll, I'll say a word or two about you here. In that sense, favor for favor, you see, on one condition, on one condition. This is Curley in Massachusetts, Curley in Boston. This was, uh, I'm sure, at Hague, probably in New Jersey. Every crook, for that matter, was able to do it because he was able to have a little certain kind of local clout to get it. So in that sense, you understand it, uh, the act that it's a, what can you do for me? Where is mine? So if you say, so if you follow, what can you do for me as part of the blood? Now, it would take a sophisticated voter or an idealistic voter, someone beyond that, to say, that's not it. What's happened to our community? And that's what we've been lacking for a long, long. Now, that was beginning to be the case in the decade that is put down by every hack in town, the 60s. Most is fashionable to put down the 60s today because the dope began the family values, just whatever that means, uh, extremism, sexual promiscuity. No one speaks of the 60s and the young that causes outside themselves. Spring and summer, civil rights, anti-war. So the 60s was a moment that also had a sense of community to it as well. In that sense, that precinct captain was no longer, at least in many quarters, the all-important figure he is today. Not the precinct, but politics in its traditional low-level sense. You know, I was reading your book, and I was speaking to Peter, you know, through my adult life. The thing that I've loved the most about them is hearing the voices of people, mm -hmm. letting people talk for themselves so I can hear what they sound like, mm -hmm. what they think like, what they feel. Um, you've done this experiment as we've been sitting talking, but what would the voice of people in Chicago politics sound like? What, when they well, right now, then, see, well, first, there's a, there's a Chicago dialect, by the way. There is a Chicago dialect. There is. For Daly is Irish-American. He's Irish ancestor, and yet his dialect is Slavic. When you hear Daly's voice, it's not Irish brogue, as it might be for a Bostonian. It isn't at all. It's Slavic. You'll hear down by the, you see, and you have sometimes the article not used, down by house. They didn't say that, but often it's said by a steel worker who came from Poland, let's say. And because Chicago is a tremendous Slavic, Eastern European, the biggest Polish city in the world outside of Warsaw, the biggest Catholic city. But it's interesting that uh, it, it's the Chicago's dominant dialect would be Slavic. Today, of course, it's changed considerably with the big 
migration, in migration of Hispanic and Southern black and Asiatic. So it is taking a change, as it is in so many cities of the country. Yeah, I think we see I'm repeating my, we're not, well, I'm not giving you what you want, but you, 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 can, you can pick up stuff here and there. Sure, sure, sure. We're going to stuff. But politics, I mean, is there a Chicago voice in terms of how they, how they think about politics, how people on the street talk about politics, care about politics? I, I guess what we're saying is that when we went and we covered this stuff last year, you know, we went with black aldermen, mm. we went with Mexican mm. aldermen, Puerto Rican aldermen, mm. Irish aldermen, and if I closed my eyes and I heard what they were saying to people, yeah. the way they were addressing the yeah. group, I didn't, you know, they were all, they sounded the same to me because they were just the street level, precinct captain, organization stuff that I just haven't heard in other places. Don't you find that in other cities? No, no. Mm. That's why we're here. <laughs> Well, I accept that as a matter of course for other cities because I've lived in Chicago almost all my life. So therefore, I accept that tribal aspect you talk about, although some cities are more homogenous than Chicago. But I mean, large American cities are completely similar to Chicago, but apparently it isn't. It does have a certain kind of uh, robust, for want of a better phrase, tradition, for better or for worse. You know, Chicago, after all, has had some pretty rough, aside from the 68 convention, the 1919 race riot, of course, has been. Not that other cities haven't had, God knows they have since then. But Chicago is one, I suppose you call it a city of extremes as well. Not accidental, and this is the part first we can close with. The respectables of Chicago, the respect, especially upper class respectables, do not mind Chicago's reputation through the 30s and 40s as the home of Al Capone, you know, you know, they, oh God, it's the, they don't mind it because someone gives them the air of raffishness, gives them the air of having lived a life they never dreamed because their lives are so dull and drab and they deep, deep down know it, you see. And so when they travel to Europe in these posh resorts where they may be, Chicago, oh, boom, boom, that's the usual reaction. And for, oh, not really, says this dowager, but she loves it, you see. She loves it because it gives her a feeling, hey, maybe she is like Betty Davis or Claire Trevor, you know? She, oh boy, she loves that other because her own life is not bad, you see. And so that aspect of Chicago is still carried on. So I always like to speak of Chicago as not, you know, people say the most, what a corrupt city. Not more corrupt than certainly Jersey City under Hayden. Or Newark, which was Jersey City, Jersey City. under Hayden. Corrupter more so. We know there's corruption in the corruption in the Southwest, but Chicago's corruption had always an aspect of color to it, of a largeness to it. So I call it the Big Daddy of corrupt cities. I think we got it. I that's think great. we got it. That's Maybe you right. got one or two things. <laughs> <to> <laughs> no, 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 that's great. <laughs>